in your ear with our first episode of Student of the Month. And what better way to kick off this series than with our guest, Michaela Matthews. Michaela is absolutely brilliant. Her practice routine and mindset took her from zero to 225 in just nine months. We are gonna learn all about her journey and exactly what she did to achieve such a great accomplishment. Michaela, how did you first hear about court reporting? I heard about court reporting by watching a TV show. I was watching an adoption scene and seeing the court reporter in the corner and I was just fascinated by what she was doing. So I Googled it right away and the things I found, it was obvious that this is what I wanted to do. What were the things that you saw on Google that showed you that this was the career for you? The whole idea of the career is what drew me to it. The actual writing on the machine was what definitely excited me the most. It looked like something that was fun to do, that was challenging, and something that would always be challenging and something that you could always improve on. And as well as the the whole aspect of the career. Did you realize that it would be a court reporting thing or did you know it was gonna be a captioning thing? When I was young, I wanted to be a lawyer, so it took me back to that idea of being in the law system, which I really, I really liked that. And as well as just like the freedom of the freelancing and the making your own schedule was always something that I wanted to do. Like I want to have kids someday. So the ability to make my own schedule and kind of work around that was something that really drew me to the career as well. Did you know that it was at your pace program for the most part? Yes, I, I came across that as well, which definitely ties me as a goal-oriented person. It was two years and four years. I knew that putting my everything I had into it, I could do it in a shorter amount of time. Did you read any stories of people doing it maybe in 10 months or in 12 yeah. months? Yes, I read a couple stories about that, which just solidified it more for me to be able to tell myself that I could be one of those people and I could do it in a shorter amount of time. And it was just motivating for me. How do you decide which school to attend? I'm Canadian, so we have one option here in Edmonton, Alberta. I researched for about a week and just decided that this is, was the avenue I wanted to take. So I applied right away and was told that I was waitlisted. It's a very popular program. That was in February and I kept my hopes high for a few months, but uh, it was around July that I figured that it wasn't in the cards for me that year. So I decided to take another year off from school, which wasn't in my plans, but I knew that court reporting was going to be worth it. So I took a few months off and moved to Mexico to volunteer. And I really enjoyed that. And then I applied on the day that it opened and was accepted uh, for the next year. Do you actually speak Spanish? Yeah, so I was, I would say about an inter intermediate Spanish speaker by the time I left. And that was one of the reasons why I went down there was it was always a dream of mine to learn another language and immersing yourself is the best way to learn a language. So I lived with the family, only spoke Spanish to them and I had a teacher come in and help me learn how to speak Spanish. By the time I left there after a few months, I was an intermediate Spanish speaker, but now after learning Seno, I feel like there's only Seno briefs in my brain. <laughs> but I, I totally agree. I have been an exchange student or I was an exchange student since I was eight years old. I'm going to different French islands and then I went to the Dominican Republic and I was, my first year, I was like stuck with a family and none of them know new English. And it's just so crazy how you just adapt. You just learn, but it's yes. just because you're fully immersed and you have no other option. The only option you have is to survive. And in order to survive, you have to be able to communicate. Uh, and I think that's so important when we think about how do we practice Steno, we have to immerse ourselves into it. Uh, so let's talk actually a little bit about that. Before we got on the air, you mentioned that when you're not on your machine, you still have steno in your brain. Yes, I, I know it might sound silly, but I think that always writing steno in my head really helped me build speed fast. Um, I almost imagine it as a game and how my fingers are on the keyboard is that's how I imagine it in my brain. So once I got to the keyboard, after thinking about steno and every conversation, movie, TV show, everything, once I got onto the machine, it was that muscle memory was there and it was just almost natural. So it was a visualization, but were you also like moving your fingers when the steno came to your head? No, it was all 100% visualization for me. Uh, I just almost imagined the steno keyboard in my head, what keys I would press, and that just helped me memorize my briefs and 
different formations. Visualization is one of those big things that a lot of successful competitors contribute their success to uh, is that just visualizing themselves winning and visualizing themselves on their way to the competition. And so I think there's a lot to be said about that as we can apply it to Steno. Sometimes when I first started school, especially, I would hear a word and I think Steno, it would, it would like drive me crazy. Be like every time you hear a word or you see a sign on the street, you think of, oh my gosh, what's a Steno? It's a Steno. And it's like, you can't turn it off. But I think it's actually one of those things that we should be thankful for because it's helping us be completely immersed into the program. Exactly. And I totally agree. Like some words off the top of my head are like descriptive words, like awesome and fantastic. And all those for me would be like two or multiple strokes. So those come up a lot in like movies and TV shows. So it was just a way to get briefs for words like that, that are very, really uncommon. And now that they come up, I won't even hesitate at them. What theory did you learn? I was taught a modified version of STEN ed at my school. And then obviously you started making your own modifications. How did you know you're ready? Because a lot of times schools or even mentors will tell people to just master their theory. At what point did you feel that you were ready to start modifying your writing? Yeah, that's one thing that I think I did. Uh, Different compared to a lot of people is I knew right from the beginning of wanting to be a court reporter that I wanted to write short and I wanted to write fast. So I knew going into it with learning a STEN ed and knowing that STEN ed was a uh, write out theory that I was just going to shorten it as soon as possible. And if you ask one of my instructors, as soon as possible came too soon, but I started shortening my theory as the day I started speed building. What about conflicts? Do you have conflicts because um, of that? No, I always make sure best I can that I don't create any conflicts for myself. And it's so far so good. Well, were you a little concerned about starting your program because it was STEN ed, knowing what you knew about STEN ed and about the other theories that were available out there? Yes, I was a little nervous because if you look up uh, information about the STEN ed theory, a lot of people say um, it's too long, you're, you're wasting your time, etc. But I just did a more research and I asked asked around that people that were using STEN ed and they said it's 100% possible to shorten it. And so I just went into recording school with the goal that I was going to take that foundation of Sen Ed and shorten it to be something of my own. And that's what I've done so far. And I'm going to continue to do it. And did you start working on your theory before starting the program? Or did you work on any type of theory before you actually had your first day of class? So I didn't actually start working on my theory from like a theory book. um, But I did take the A to Z course a few months before I started school. And so I had that machine with me. And with what you learn in A to Z, I just took that and solidified it. So I knew how to write every single one syllable word in the English language, I think. And as well as the long vowels keyboard memorization that was concrete by the time I started. So that's the first 10 lessons of my theory, all concrete in my brain by the time I started. And that sounds like a good idea, though. You have a blueprint that a lot of people would want to follow that if before they even get into steno school, if they could at least master the keyboard, that would be great. Yes, I think a lot of people, this, the hardest part is memorizing, memorizing the keyboard and not looking at your hands. Just from the research, knowing that looking at your hands would cause a problem later on. I taught myself right from the beginning, no looking at my hands, feeling where every key is and just knowing 100% where that key is. And I think with building that for so many months has helped me with keeping accuracy all the way up to 225. Absolutely. I 100% agree. I, I was one of the people when I started dentist school, I did not even know what the machine looked like until my first day of class. And uh, <laughs> I remember it was probably like three or four months in the teacher, we had the keyboard on the board and the teacher said she's going to take it down. And I was like freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Was your A to Z online or in person? Online. So they had it in person, but since I was I was living located in Estevan. I just did remote. Okay. Agency. Okay. And then, so now you actually had a steno experience online, and you have steno experience in person. What do you think is the best option? I, for me, is in person. I love the just the idea of being there and being with other people and having that support system was very important to me. How important is that support system? Uh, Very important, in my opinion. Um, Just knowing that you're not alone, because it's no secret that dental school is a struggle. It's hard. Um, To having that support system is so important and so helpful. What else about being part of a brick and mortar school do you feel contributed to your success? 
There was a lot of things that attracted me to a brick and mortar school, one being the schedule. Uh, I've always been the kind of person that thrives off of having a schedule and just being structured. And I feel like another thing is the dedication that it takes. Having a schedule was easier for me to follow than having to discipline myself. I give a lot of credit for to students that are able to do it online. And I like to think that I would be able to have that d- discipline and motivation to practice like I did if it was online. But I feel like that's a bit of wishful thinking. The structure was very important to me. What was your schedule like in school? Was it Monday through Friday? Yeah, we attended school Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. How much of that time was solo time? Like, did you have any time to just practice by yourself with your headphones or was it always live dictation? A lot of us always went in early to practice. That was the alone time. But most of our class, we had the one hour lunch, but then we spent about two hours on our machine every day. And then we also had academic classes every day. So you had two hours in the school with the teacher on your machine, and then you would get there early sometimes for an extra two hours or an extra two hours after school to practice. So on your machine time is only two hours while in school for the actual curriculum? Yes. So we usually spent um, and two hours being just dictated by our instructors. And then we also had uh, classes where we worked on our theory, where we were just given word lists and... And then also we also had a classes to work on briefs and we were tested on briefs where we would be given a dictation and we would have to hand in our notes and so they would make sure that we're using the briefs that they were giving us. You know, that still tells me that you it was absolutely necessary to still practice outside of class. Yes, our minimum outside of class was two hours a day, uh, but I usually tried to do two to three hours as often as I could. Monday through Friday, for you personally, how how many hours would you say were you on the machine? Monday through Friday, I'm not too sure. I always did Monday to Sunday. Uh, I would try to do 20 to 25 hours. How would you structure your practice time outside of school, like on Saturday and Sunday? So on Saturday and Sunday, I've always been the kind of person to get my practice done in the morning. I think that just takes away the opportunity for your brain to say, I don't feel like practicing or I want to do something else. I just, it was the first thing I did when I got up and sat down and practiced. I was also one to not take breaks. I just like to sit down, especially once I get in the groove, it's hard for me to stop sometimes. I would usually do my full two to three hours and then have the rest of the day to enjoy my weekend. On Saturdays and Sundays, you would practice just one time? Yeah, usually just one time in the morning for two to three hours. Uh, sometimes if I wasn't doing anything that day, I would go go back to it. But usually I like to just have a really good effective practice session in the morning and focus my other attention on other things not related to Steno. <laughs> Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. First thing in the morning is the best time to practice, not only because your willpower like dwindles, but also your mental energy. And Steno, especially when you're trying to improve yourself, it, it requires the utmost amount of energy and focus and concentration that you can give it. So if you can do it first thing in the morning, you're definitely going to get better results. You'll get better results doing it two to two, two to three hours in the morning than two to three hours right before bed. Like it's not even the same thing. Exactly. On Saturdays and Sundays, how would you know what to practice? My practice routine basically stayed the same on Saturdays and Sundays. It was just usually longer. I did the exact same thing as I did Monday to Friday, which was just, I started with my briefs and I speed built. And what do you mean by you started with your briefs? Uh, One thing I started right from my speed building journey was um, writing down briefs in a little brief book. And so once I would accumulate enough briefs, I would say about like 50 briefs, usually it took about a couple days to a week to accumulate that many briefs. And then I would sit down and make my own dictation on my phone, just reading them. Um, I wouldn't time them at all. I just read them with what I thought I would be comfortable at. And what I would do is I would take about 10 to 15 briefs and just read through them back and forth for about two minutes. And then I would go on to the next 10 to 15 for two minutes, just reading. And I would make sure that I would um, split up families of briefs so that I could get my fingers used to hitting all the briefs back and forth really fast. I would split them up into groups of like 10 to 15. And that was just so that I could really focus on drilling those ones. And I would read through them back and forth, making sure I split up any families of briefs. And by that, I just mean like words and then their suffixes so that my fingers would get used to writing the briefs all over. 
because if I was writing one brief and the, the next brief was just adding an S, it's too easy. And I liked to have that challenge to switch between briefs. So I would make sure I read them all back and forth and mixed up. And then once I felt like I was comfortable with those briefs, I would move on to the, the next 10 to 15. And I would just do that with all of the new briefs that I had from that week or whatever. And then I would do that dictation every single morning. So I usually tried to make the dictations 10 to 15 minutes long so that I could do them um, evenly on <laughs> while practicing, or I could do them twice if they were harder. But yeah, that's how I have always practiced briefs. And I think it's really helped. So that's how you would warm up is with your brief dictation that you made yourself. Yes. So that's how I, I always warmed up with briefs and numbers. Are you a number bar person or are you writing the number person? I'm a number bar person. Okay, me too. <laughs> One of the things we're always told is if we're going to start using briefs and phrases is that we have to learn the families together. So if we're going to learn the phrase, it happened, we might as well learn um, it's happening all at the same time instead of just learning one phrase or one brief at a time, might as well learn the entire family. But you mentioned that you split it up. Is that just in your drills or all the time? That's just in my drills. So what I mean by that is I would write down that brief. So I'll use your example as it happened, it happens, it ha it's happening. But in order to really get my fingers used to going from outline to outline, I would switch up. It happened with adding in another brief in between that. So like it happened, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's happening so that my fingers get used to going to a totally different outline instead of just staying in that formation and adding a suffix. I think that is a fabulous way of practicing. And I think what you're saying, it makes 100% sense because if you're practicing the family back to back to back, your brain and your fingers become so comfortable and you're just shifting maybe one key and you're not training yourself to write it regardless of what came before or after, you're just practicing the family. And that's not how it comes up in the real world. So I uh, definitely think that's great what you did. Exactly. I always try to tell myself that I'm practicing for if this brief came up with having no idea that it's coming up. And the best way to do that is practicing with other words in between families of briefs. You never know what the witness or the television person, you never know what they're gonna say, but it doesn't matter what they say, you still need to write it. So if if they call the lady a him, you have to just write it. You can't hesitate, you don't have time to hesitate. So practicing the way you're doing with all these unrelated words um, that you need to not hesitate on, I think that's a great way to to build your speed and confidence. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> After you warm up with your briefs and stuff, what in briefs and numbers, what else do you do? Once I feel warmed up, I would just go for speed. That was my whole practice routine. Right from the beginning, I forced myself to write well above my speed goal, like 30 to 50 words per minute above usually. And so what I would do is I would pick a dictation and write 30 to 50 above for 75% of the time that I spent on it, which was usually about 30 minutes to an hour and just once I pressed play, I would write it. And sometimes like if I felt that I hesitated on, hesitated on a word, I would go back or I would drill that word. Obviously it's gonna feel too fast, but if I felt like I kept up to the speaker, I did the best I could, I would just press play again. And I would do it anywhere from five to seven times before slowing it back down to my goal speed. There's a lot in there that I wanted to dissect. Oh, sorry. First is you said <laughs> right from the beginning. Do you mean right when you started theory or do you mean when you started speed building? When did you start increasing the 50 words per minute? Honestly, right from when I began theory. So right back to lesson like 10 or 12 in theory, right when we got those word lists, um, I think they were dictated at 20 words per minute. I would obviously start at 20 words per minute, but once I was feeling comfortable, I was just never comfortable with feeling comfortable. So I would speed it up. I always used Windows Media Player and I would do 1.2 times the speed. And if that felt comfortable, 1.4 times the speed. And there was a lot of times I was doing the 20 word per minute speed goal, or there was a lot of times I was doing the 20 word per minute word list at two times the speed in theory. And I think that's a super smart move that definitely contributed to your success. And I hope uh, a lot of students and teachers are listening out there. It's great that you started with the 20 word per minute. You made sure you knew where your keys were. You, you made sure you understood the concept. But once you d got that, you're able to push yourself a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And it's hard these days when you're in school and once you finish theory, they expect you to pass an 80 word per minute literature, but you're only accustomed to writing 20 or 40 words per minute for the whole beginning of your steno life. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And so I think that was a, a great idea, but like, how did you come up with that idea? 
Honestly, I think it was just the wanting to write faster and going into court reporting school with the goal that I wanted to make it to 225 in a short amount of time that I knew that, hey, if I was comfortable writing these words, why not push myself to go faster? And it's just fun for me to challenge myself. And I, th- I definitely think that's one of the things that will contribute to your success in any field is a challenge. When you feel like something is too easy, you're like, eh, I don't need to do it. I'll do it another day. It's not going to be that hard. And it's so easy to put off and to not be excited about it. Of course, if something is way too challenging, you just want to give up. What I tell people is you want to feel like you're that close to getting it, even if you're not that close, but you want to at least feel that close. You never want to feel like, oh, I got this. You always want to challenge yourself. Exactly. And that is really what drove me to do this all through theory. Like, Even getting up to the 60 words per minute, I was just, I felt comfortable at that speed. So just forcing myself to write at 80 and 90 and even up to 110 sometimes in theory made it that transition from theory to speed building way smoother. One thing that really helped me is just knowing that I might have hesitated on that first time, but it was more beneficial for me to just do it again than to spend the time drilling it or finding a way to write it differently, just trying again. But if I continued to hesitate at it, that's when I would decide, okay, this word's a problem. And then I would decide whether to brief it or to write a different way. But I think just the endurance, like you said, is important. So just giving yourself a second chance almost. So you didn't stop the dictation. Even if you hesitated, you would keep going. Yes. I think it was important to, especially like in tests, sometimes you might hesitate, but you just got to You just got to drop and keep going or try to get something for that word, even if it's just one stroke and continue on. What about reading back your actual steno notes? How are you able to gain benefit by reading back your steno notes? I only read back my steno notes when it was at my goal speed. I feel like that was the most beneficial for me and the things that I would look for, words that I would stroke in multiple strokes when I I knew it could have been one or just phrasing opportunities, like simple phrasing opportunities that you might not seem save a lot of time, but actually do just making mental notes for myself to phrase them next time. And as well as any missed strokes, uh, I know that there's things that we know about our own writing and so just and as well as just looking for any misstrokes that I made during the dictation and just making sure that I take that into account and try not to do that next time. So one of the things that I find very interesting is that you say you take a lot of mental notes, but you also have a notebook where you keep your briefs. Is there a reason you don't feel the need to write down the, these mental notes? I just kept my book for writing down briefs and phrases and more so for like any Anything that I was making mistakes on, I would just take mental notes. That's just what has worked for me from the beginning. Um, Once I would tell myself, okay, you can phrase that, it would just, going forward, my brain would just phrase it. Where were you getting your phrases and brief outlines from? Um, I would make a lot of my briefs and phrases up, as well as I get them from other court reporters. um, And Facebook as well is a really good source for me from my briefs and phrases. So you just got what worked for you or made it work for you. That's perfect. Were you doing that while you were in theory at all? No, I didn't start changing my theory. I would just only use the briefs that we were taught in class. When you were practicing, would you transcribe your notes? During my practice sessions, the most important thing to me was just being on the machine and writing and writing fast and trying to become more comfortable at the the faster speed so that my goal speed would sound slower. So I never did spend time transcribing my notes during practice. Did you feel prepared to transcribe when it was time to take a test? Yeah, I always felt prepared uh, to transcribe during tests. I feel like my English class came uh, was the reason for that. Uh, We always practiced editing transcripts in English class. So that really helped when it came time to edit tests. How long would a five minute test take you to transcribe? It definitely changed throughout. Um, I would say at a hundred words per minute or 80 words per minute starting out, I think it took me about uh, 20 to half, 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, and then up to uh, 225, it was around 45 minutes to an hour. Would you transcribe every single test? I didn't transcribe every single test. Uh, I wish I could say I did, Um, but sometimes it's just inevitable that uh, it's not going to be our day and some tests are going to fly right past you. And I personally don't think there's much benefit in sitting there and going through those notes because I feel like honestly, it's just not motivating. Uh, So I chose to delete those ones, but 
On the other hand, if it was a test that maybe it was a little harder or I, ha I know I had to drop or I was got messy, but I was hanging on, I would force myself to transcribe those, even though I knew in my heart it was a fail because of the importance of trying to read through your slop and seeing the mistakes that I was making over and over in tests. Throughout the program, how much of would you say that you were focusing on accuracy or real-time writing? And then how much were you s focused on speed? Like what percentage did you give it? Um, my focus was... Usually, I would say actually 50-50. Um, I feel like I was lucky that in-class dictation was a little slower for me since I was ahead. So I was able to focus all of my class time to get 100% accuracy every time, or that's what I was striving for. And then once I got into the practice room, it was speed, speed, speed. That makes a lot of sense on how to <laughs> balance your time in class versus out of class. When you were testing, did you feel nervous? Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, testing nerves are so frustrating. and I wish I had some sort of magical power that I could take everyone's testing nerves away. Uh, that would be amazing. But I definitely dealt with it too. Um, there was my one instructor had something she said ev before every test that became my thing right from 80 words per minute that helped me. And what she would say is take a deep breath, relax, and I'll see you in five. And those last words, see you in five, were very calming to me. And I would repeat in my head, see you in five. And it just reminded me that we as Steno students, we practice for hours and hours and we work, put all are all into practicing and this was just five minutes you just have to give your all for five minutes and that's what really helped me every single test perfect once the test started my nerves always left once the test started i was i really tried so hard to just focus on the next word and staying on the speaker that i didn't focus on my nerves i let that pass and i just focused on the word coming next your brain can only focus on one thing at a time so you could either focus on your nerves or you could focus on the next word so if you want to get through the program faster focus on the next word <laughs> exactly <laughs> and now you have already passed your 25s and what are you going to do now like what's up you're still in school what's going on i'm still in school for another year until april of 2021 um and my goal is to it might sound crazy, but to still gain speed, um, I want to be comfortable at speeds higher than 225, as well as um, working on real time. So my practice schedule looks a little different now. I do one day of speed building and one day of um, accuracy, whereas I just write a take and I copy and paste it to see my accuracy. Yeah, my goal is to enjoy my last year and to start working in a career that I love. I think that's really good that you're actually staying in school for an extra year. I heard of one student that went to my program at Sheridan and I never met him. So I guess he's just like a legend, but basically he stayed in school for an extra year after he passed his 225s. And then once he got out of the program, he was already doing real time. And then I think he like made 200,000 his first year, but because he was that good of a real time writer. And then of course, living in a big metropolitan area. And so I definitely, especially if you get through school so quickly, like you're better off spending an extra year to get your real time where it needs to be, because then your job is going to be so much easier and you're going to make so much more and your confidence is going to be so much higher. What are your other goals to complete within the next year? Along with building more speed and practicing real time, I'm working towards getting my RPR as soon as possible. And then do you plan on working as a freelancer in Canada or do you do you have some other country on the horizon? Um, I plan on staying in Canada for a little while. Um, eventually, I, I'm definitely willing to relocate. A dream of mine has always been to travel with Deno. I think it would be really cool to do what I love as a career and see the world. Spending that extra year is really going to help you as well get those international jobs because a lot of the international jobs, even if they're not real time jobs, they want a real time writer because a real time writer is usually a more responsible writer and will be able to produce a transcript much faster. And um, usually it just shows that you're a higher caliber of reporter. So even if it's not a real-time job for international jobs, they will still want a real-time writer. You're definitely doing what you need to so that you can get those kind of jobs in the future. But now are you working at all? I'm not working right now. I think what's offered in second year at my school is such valuable information. So I'm just going to focus on getting that to put myself ahead in the career when I do join the industry. How close was the Steno school to you, the Steno school that you actually got accepted into? Not close. Um, I'm from Saskatchewan, and so I actually re relocated to here to Edmonton, Alberta, and it's about 10 hours away from home. Do you live on campus? No, I am just renting an apartment in the city. 
your whole time is just dedicated to steno. I know you mentioned that you drill uh, your numbers and sometimes you'll drill a word or phrase, but what about actual finger drills? Do you use finger drills as part of your practice routine? Um, I didn't really focus my time much on finger drills. I felt like I already had that dexterity built from playing piano and clarinet growing up. Um, having that dexterity to hit multiple keys at once came naturally to me, so I didn't feel the need to do finger drills. Other than helping with your dexterity, did you feel that learning piano in any way helped you learn steno? Yeah, I think piano helped in multiple different ways. Uh, one was definitely the memorization. Um, just with having to memorize the steno keyboard, you have to memorize the piano keyboard. And as well with just practicing, if you wanted to get better, the only way was to, pra was to practice. And so having that from an early age, I just stuck with it when I got to court reporting school. And I knew that the only way I was going to get better was to practice a lot and to practice effectively. Michaela, as our parting gift to our listeners, I would love for you to share with us something that we could all start implementing right now, which is a shift in mindset. What is the mindset that has carried you from zero to 225 in nine months? I think the most important mindset to have is just knowing that it's doable and believing in yourself, knowing that it is doable. My mindset right from the beginning when I decided to go to court reporting school was that I was going to gain speed fast and I just told myself that every day and just tell yourself that it is doable and that's what I did. I read the stories of other people doing it so I knew it was doable and I just continued to tell myself every day that I was going to do what I needed to do to be able to gain speed fast and that's what I just carried over once I started school. I knew that every day not taking a day off was important to just continue to gain speed and I think just the mindset of knowing that it's what I wanted for a career. So I was going to do everything to be able to get there and to be able to get there fast. And I was going to do everything that I could to be able to do it too. Stena Squad, one more thing before we sign off. You can download the PDF summary of Michaela's practice routine. You can find it in the files section of the Facebook group, Steno Student Success. See you next month on episode two of Student of the Month. Michaela, thank you so much for letting us peer into your steno life and learn about you and learn about your practice routines and your mindset and just everything you did to have such an accomplishment that this is truly an exemplary and therefore thank you so much and I wish you much success on your steno journey. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed doing this podcast.